Hello and welcome to another episode of Webflow and Code where I teach you the underlying code you're writing in Webflow. Today's episode is going to be all about forms and some hidden aspects that you might not already know about. So if you're excited about that, then stick around. I won't cover the basics of forms and Webflow. For that, I will point you in the direction of Webflow University. What I'm looking to do in this episode is just cover some of the bases that I feel like they missed out on or, or some important points that the Webflow University kind of doesn't touch on. And hopefully give you some more insight into, into using forms and understanding actually what's going on so that you can be more creative and, 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 and create uh, do more interesting things with your form. So let's cover the technicalities of a form. If you're not really interested in that sort of stuff, then I always leave chapter markers in each video so that you can kind of skip across to a, a section that you're more interested in. A form is a way for a user to send data from outside to your website or internet application. It does this in two ways, via get or via post. And the difference is quite simple, really. A get request will send it via the URL. And you'll notice this in something like Google. Uh, if you go to google.com slash search um, and, and kind of search something, you'll see in the URL will place a question mark with a Q, um, meaning query, and then equals, and then whatever that your query was. What this is, this is Google sending itself a, a get request via its search form. And then the page in the, in the, the code in the back end is then interpreting that uh, query string in the, in the back end and then producing the results before the page loads. For Google search to essentially work, all it needs is, is that. And then each parameter is separated by an ampersand for the different uh, types of information or different types of data with key value pairs. And then this is great for kind of sharing state. So for example, if you're on an e-commerce site and you, you're, you're looking at a product and you select the size and the color, uh, what will they, what they'll often do is is write that write those selections or whatever to the query string uh, in, in the URL, and then you can send that to your friend. And when they visit that same URL, they'll be greeted with the same color and the same sort of styles because the code in the back end is reading those query strings and then modifying the page in order to sort of adhere to those those query string parameters. And it's important to say that those query string parameters are whatever the back end code expects it to be. So, you know, in Google's case, it's Q. Um, in, in an e-commerce site, it might be product and basic things like product or color. So we can demonstrate this by, if we we've got our form here, if we set the name to Q as an example, um, and we set the form to Google slash uh, search. It's going to get because we want it to show up in the URL. Whatever the value of this will be, it will send it to Google and navigate to that page. And we hit enter. And what we'll see is that there's our there's our query there. So the other option is post. And that is a much more secure way of sending data as it's not sending anything, uh, any information in the URL. But once again, the back end code needs to be written in a way where it's expecting a the, the data to be sent as a post. Just to demonstrate how a post could work as well. So if we set this to post, let me get to the page. We inspect this element here and go to the network, submit. Then you've got the fields of Q, test, dolphin, false. I wonder what that is. That's probably something to do with security. There's the data that we're sending via post. So you can see how it's kind of hidden or not hidden, but it's, it's more secure kind of sent as a header as opposed to in the URL. Of course, you don't care about all this when it comes to Webflow. Um, Webflow doesn't give you access or, or any way to manipulate that backend code. It's kind of taking care of everything for you. But just so you know kind of what's going on, it might give you a bit of context. That's why I kind of explained it. So with that out of the way, let's get into the Webflow concepts of forms and discuss those in a little bit more detail. So a form is essentially wrapping a set of elements or inputs that denote a kind of block of content. If you want two forms on a page, for instance, that's two separate 
uh, blocks of content that you want to uh, that you want to send. You can't send both of them at the same time. If you want those things, then you need to wrap it in in just a single form and use that to send all the data that you you kind of want to receive on the back end. I've seen instances where I've seen forms within forms. I've seen instances where there's a form wrapping each. Uh, element each input and this is all kind of incorrect usage of of a form you you had just have one form that wraps all of your uh, inputs inputs need labels uh, this is kind of written into the core of uh, web uh, the w3c the what kind of web fundamentals and accessibility guidelines it inputs need labels I believe I mentioned this in the past. Um, a label is kind of crucial for screen readers to understand kind of uh, what what they're supposed to input into a form. Um, I've seen examples where the label is removed and placeholders are are put there. Uh, this it's it's okay. It doesn't give um, a clear indication of what's to go in the form, and particularly when you kind of select and start typing, you've you've already lost the context of what. Uh, what you're supposed to be putting into the form. So there's kind of some UX concerns as to why a placeholder isn't um, ideal or just having a placeholder ideal. If, if admittedly, it's a, a, not a lot cleaner U, uh, UI without a label, if you must have this, if there's kind of, you know, no way of kind of getting around it or whatever, then um, if you check out my SR only uh, class uh, video. I'll leave that in the in the card. That will kind of teach you how you can have a, a a label or a piece of context, and that you can hide it visually off the screen. But it's still it's still there, and it still assists in the kind of accessibility and usability of a form. Webflow handles labels um, really uh, terribly. So I read from a Webflow employee that Webflow will link an input and a label when they're next to each other. And I've never got that to work. So what I always end up doing is creating a HTML embed element and you, you link the two by using the ID of the input. You take that ID and when you create a label, you put the four tag there. And there are some benefits uh, to doing that as well. When you've got a label, you actually get free functionality of clicking the label and it kind of auto focuses on the element. That's that's a way that some people actually expect to interact with a form. So you, you do get that kind of free functionality there. Kind of another tip or, or another kind of um, gotcha when it comes to, to forms, particularly on mobile, uh, that Webflow will, Webflow by default will set the size of the text of an input to 14. Now, accessibility guidelines say the minimum size for font should be 16. Um, but what's actually happening is that when you use your, your form on mobile, and you click on that input element, it will actually zoom in to that input element. And that's because the font size is too small. If you set it to 16, then you won't get any of that zooming um, sort of functionality or zooming kind of assistance. It's there to help people because the font size is too small. But like I say, if it's 16, if you don't like that functionality, then set it to 16 and it, it won't zoom in basically. So another thing about forms as well is that forms require a submit button, a single submit button. So there are ways to kind of send form information through JavaScript. Um, and what I see kind of on web development projects is that developers will bind click events to the button uh, of, uh, you know, of a form and it won't be a submit button. And then they'll kind of send the, the data that way. By, by having a submit button, this causes the form to submit because it recognizes there's a submit button there. It causes the form to submit. And if you're ever in a situation where you need to use JavaScript to send off information or data, then I would suggest you bind that event to send the data to the submit event of the form rather than the click event of the button. You're kind of, again, you're getting free functionality there. When when you've got a submit button and, and you are responding to the, the sort of submit event of the form, that will enable the user to click enter, which which often, again, I do, you know, for, for a login, if I'm logging in with my username and password, I'll hit enter to actually submit that form. Um, that way I don't have to move my mouse or click the submit button. So again, you're getting that free functionality because this is expected behavior of a form. 
once again, if you want me to kind of go into detail on submitting a form with JavaScript and the various implications of that, then leave me a comment below and I can I can try and arrange making one. So that's a few basic kind of technicalities of, of a form and, and how to kind of lay it out. Let's now go into the options that you get when you're when you're editing a form and what they kind of do and what you can do with them or what, what's expected to be done with them. So by clicking a form here, there's nothing crazy um, about the 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 show the show state here. All these are are some um, you know they're ju they're just some elements with a class of w form done and w form um, uh, fail. I think don't don't quote me on that one. And on if, if a form is successful, it just Webflow will just show and hide depending on those sorts of things. So there's nothing really special about those there. The form name is interesting. So this will be the name of the form when it gets submitted to the Webflow CMS or the, the Webflow backend. Uh, the interesting thing about the form name is that you can actually use it to place a submit button outside of the form because the submit button needs to be in the form for it to work. You can place a submit button outside the form um, and by setting a form attribute on that input then you can you can then link it the form to it and then that for that button will then submit the form you might want to check can i use on that one uh last time i checked it wasn't widely compatible with a lot of browsers but things that might have changed and i would suggest you always check can i use when you're when you're uh, using attributes and, and css and things like that so yeah do check that out redirect url of course it's just where the page goes after there's a success you know they've given you an example here it could go to a separate page or it could show and hide the success form um states the action is where you send your data and this is again where it gets a bit complex and and i'm happy to make a, a video on using your own kind of system to receive um, data but the action yeah will be essentially a url that you can use to to where you want to send your data to now if there is no response from that website or that page to say that the, the data has been handled or whatever, then it will actually navigate to that page. Whereas if there is a response, then what it will do, the Webflow, um, Webflow will just, again, just show and hide the success and error message depending on what, uh, what message or what data is returned from that URL that you've specified. Once again, if you don't specify anything, then it's just gonna navigate to that page and, and, and give that page the data. Thing is with this is that in the past I've actually helped people, um, you know, send data to a custom kind of backend that they've written. I've had trouble with this that is not working. I guess I guess you could probably have trouble with a lot of, um, you know, you, we're kind of dependent upon Webflow team not creating any bugs with anything. But with this one, yeah, I've had trouble that if I've set something, it won't actually send data to that um, to that URL. Uh, so I've had to override it in the JavaScript. As of right now, as this video is being created, this works. So if I was to put a, a, a URL in this, it will actually navigate and, and send that data to that URL. So great stuff there. But like I say, I've had trouble with it in the past. And then finally, we have the method, which is just quite simply a get or a post. And it, it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier when it comes to what type of how you want to be sending this data if you're not really sure then i would definitely su suggest that you use post but if you know what you're doing and you think get is more appropriate then by all means use get now let's dig into the anatomy of input elements firstly the id which of course is what i was referring to earlier that we set this id uh, to link a label to it now it's important to remember if you're new to the channel and you haven't kind of been following uh, the series then i mentioned in the past that you're only supposed to have one instance of an id on the page so now we can't now have another id of name on this page you know if you want something uh, similar or whatever then it will be name one or full name or something like that the, the the whole point is you have one instance of the id on the page that's the whole point of it so in the in the context of an input then this this actually allows us to link a form to it uh, uh, an input label to it then you've got the name this is how it's kind of sent in in the kind of back end um what it's labeled as in the back end um and then a placeholder of course is just the placeholder there but that wraps up just kind of everything I wanted to go over in this in this episode. Um, 
there's still lots more to discuss when it comes to forms, including security and things like that. Uh, so let me know if you're keen for more form content in the comments below. If you like this episode and want to hear more, then I'd really appreciate uh, a subscribe. I want to kind of get this channel monotonized and I can only do that with a certain amount of subscribers. Uh, it really motivates me to make more content like this. And if you want to be notified when a new episode gets released, then of course hit the notification bell. And until next time, happy no coding.